you who have seen Ken do a monolingual, or uh, who have seen his videos, uh, well, I'm not Ken Pike. And, and uh, I am probably going to disappoint you in many ways. However, one thing that you should know is that when we do these, these are, this is real field work. I've never worked on this language, I don't think. I don't know what it is yet. Um, and uh, so it's really, it really is field work. And there's nothing magical to field work. It's just that monolingual work assumes that there's no uh, language spoken in common. I'm always amazed when I have the opportunity to do field work in a language where I can actually use another language to get the data. It is, it's like getting it for free. Uh, when you've had to work with the Pitaha, who have uh, 16 classes of suffixes, and, and will say a verb with, uh, you know, six suffixes, and then say it again with two, and I try to get the difference, they say, oh, it's just the same. <laughs> uh, these can be frustrating. But Ken also believed that monolingual methodology was the methodology to use, even if you could have used another language. It's still the best way to go. And... Um, uh, there are various reasons for this, and I have a chapter in, in a book by uh, Paul Newman and Martha Radliff on monolingual fieldwork, in which I try to give some of the reasons for this. But one of the great reasons is, is that uh, you're, you don't have any crutches to depend on. You really have to learn to speak the language you're working on. And uh, it's said that linguists can be, you can be a great linguist without speaking any language but your own. That may be true, but when you do fieldwork, it's tremendously important to make it a goal to learn to speak the language you work on. Sano Pato. Sano Pato. Pato. Sano Pato. Sano Pato.
Twitter aquí a la Usko ha kum tapai kum matica. Usko ha tapai kum matica. Matica. Yuro ha kum tapai kum matica. Yuro. Yuro ha. Mito basnaya. Mito basnaya. Mito basnaya. Mito bas ma mito bas na ay 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 sisi mahal ah sisi mahal sisi mahal Muchísima jala. Muchísima jala. Siento bien. Siento bien. Urnos. 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 Quiero chorar un lugar. Quiero chorar un lugar. Chorar un lugar. Quiero chorar un lugar. Chorar un lugar. Chorar un lugar. Chorar un lugar. The uh, sounds we heard, just some of the segments we heard. Okay, let's start with the vowels. So what um, 
You don't have to take my word for it, but let's hear what were some of the vowels that we, we heard. And then I'm going to give the speakers a chance to introduce themselves and tell us something about themselves. Um, but uh, we heard uh, you, at least I did, and an O, and an A, and an E, and an E, e that is E, and I also heard an E. Um, what other vowels? Nasalized, yeah, there were nasalized vowels, and I, I wasn't consistent in writing, but there were definitely nasalized vowels. One of the problems, is, uh, I'm used to working in a language where there's nasalization all over the place, and it's non-phonemic. So, um, this is a bad habit to get out of. Uh, so, I heard, yeah, there was nasalization, I definitely heard that. <clears throat> uh, so, we would, we would look at nasal counterparts as well. Another thing I noticed was, the first time I got uh, this Me Too Baznaya, which... Uh, uh, what does that mean? Smells good. Smells good, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, when you're living in the community, you find these things out fairly quickly because you walk out and you think this means X and you say it in the context of X and everybody laughs and you figure this out really quickly. So it smells good. But when I first heard this, I heard the realization here, Bazan Ayu. And, and then the next time, uh, it was said, Na Ayu. Uh -huh. And so, it, it would seem that, uh, as is common in languages with glottal stop, if the glottal stop is being inserted to separate the vowels, so the glottal stop disappears uh, and produces leaves a res residue of laryngealization. That's fairly common. Um, and what direction that is, I wouldn't jump to any conclusions, but if I had to uh, make my bets, and it's always good to place bets, you know, make hypotheses as you go along. My hypothesis would be that the glottal stop might be, be there underlying it, as Kim would say, emically and that it's, uh, you've got laryngealization here taking its place. But that's totally a guess, and one can find that out. Um, the other thing I should tell you is, you know, to figure out a language and do field work and write a grammar, you only have to do this uh, every day for about 10 years. Um, <laughs> for a lot longer. You can have it all figured out. Okay, um, we saw things going on with the vowels. There's a lot of stuff going on, which I couldn't tell if it was length or glottal stop deletion, just lots of things going on. The other thing to realize is that it's not your objective to get everything the first pass. Your objective is to do as well as you can the first pass, and then if there's anything Ken Pike taught us, it's that one of the most important things is how to recover from your own mistakes and, and go on. What you do next is often more important than what you did or what you do. To be able to recover and go on. So, uh, no doubt I missed lots of things, absolutely no doubt, but uh, we go on and we, we begin to build from that. We, we saw some things we wanted to look at, our intellectualization, um, and glottal stop, maybe some back vowel harmony, back high vowel harmony, or just vowel harmony in general, nasalization, some of the ideas from the vowels, so we want to look at schwa in cup. Alright, now what about uh, consonants? Let's put the consonants up here. Uh, we're in the edit perspective, right? Or the perspective of the informed non lay outsider, right? The edit. Uh, and we are looking at some of the consonants that we saw. Well, we certainly had aspiration on consonants. You, I noticed some of you enjoying the fact that it took me longer than you to pick up on that. Uh, but we definitely have, uh, let's, let's start, we had a P, and a T, and a K, and we had the, at least, at least I seem to record the aspirated varieties of those as well. And I got corrected by, by the speakers for not getting the aspiration there. Now, uh, that may mean, in fact I bet it means, that it's uh, emic, underlying. Uh, otherwise, uh, Ken would say, or Edward Sapir, that it would be hard to tell people, correct people on something that's not emic. You don't usually correct people's edit perspectives, we correct them based on our emic perspective. And so it's quite possible, therefore, that these are emic or underlying. Um, but again, these are things we have to look at. And as I make the next pass through the data, I would want to circle all of these pairs and go back and investigate and try different pronunciations and look with different speakers and, and see what can happen. Um, what we had 
I noticed a lot going on, or at least it's, I seem to get variation between flat bars and tees, and I don't know what's going on there, uh, but um, probably something is um, going on there. Um, got, a, got a D, and I got, uh, at least I recorded an African Juinta, Juinta, with uh, the labialization or perhaps a vowel sequence. Now, just looking at this, there were several vowel sequences, so this could be a, a vowel sequence. There were several vowel sequences in the language. Um, but we, we note these. Were there any other, there, there were several other consonants, but were there any other consonants that really stood out? L also seemed to interchange with R uh, as well, with the flat R, you get some of this going on. So as we make our pass through, we just uh, make, make up the different charts and the ideas that occurred to us as we're doing the data. Um, generally, um, it, it would take me about uh, an hour and then I would bring somebody else in and run through most of this stuff all over again and repeat that a couple of times. Um, anything else about the segments that anybody wanted to comment on? Let's go to syllable structure and prosody stuff. Syllable structure. That's easy. Uh, after it's analyzed. Um, well, what's going on in the syllable structure? We have, uh, do we, we have clear examples of CV. It would seem that we have, uh, well, there's CVC. There's CV, 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 it would appear. So we seem to have uh, CVs. That's not a big surprise. Uh, we have CVC, if I transcribe that correctly. We have a CVC, perhaps, uh, syllable type. Um, what other kinds of syllable types do we have? Well, uh, look at the word for yellow. Point yellow. Point yellow. Is that similar? Uh, now, is this, what do you think the I is? Is it a consonant or a vowel in that syllable? Of course, we don't know yet. We have evidence that it could be either one, because if this is correct, we have CVC. So just the first pass, this could be a, a CDV or a CBC. So how could we test that? Well, one way to test it is to see what other kinds of CBC syllables we have. So here's an alveolar, I want to write on this. And here's a, a lateral, and what looks to be a CBC syllable, although this could be a morpheme boundary, and this could be a morpheme. Uh, but it, even if it is, that's a CBC. So, um, what's the identity of this final consonant? What sorts of evidence do we have for what it can be? Do we have any clear examples of um, syllables with two vowels? Um, I'm sure we do, if I remember correctly. We have ow. Yeah, we have an I, although that's... Never trust eyes. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, there were long vowels, and, and don't... Probably shouldn't base your analysis on those two. Banana? Banana, yeah, that had... Yeah, there were, um, uh, Kieta, yeah, that probably, so we probably do, I thought there was an owl, I'm sure there's an owl in there somewhere, but there's, uh, so we seem to have, uh, CVV, although, um, that could also be CCV, right? You're making guesses about that. It's important to start with low vowels and mid vowels and not so much with high vowels, because if we start with the high vowels, uh, those are the things that are the problems. Those are the things we eventually want to resolve. High vowels have all this ambiguous behavior. So I want to start with what uh, Ken called unambiguous segments, although in reality we know that everything is ambiguous. Now, uh, the other thing about, about doing this is that if we were in the native, if we were in the, uh, the native speaker community, if we could look around us and see what else is going on, we would get lots more cues than in a classroom setting like this. There would be lots of other things going on. We might want to pull in other speakers and ask them or go off and try the pronunciation. Um, we also, one of the kinds of things we want to look for, and, and these two are really good at it, but you want to make sure you get somebody that's very severe with you and, um, and corrects you uh, uh, mercilessly. Um, so as we, look at the, as we look at the syllable structure, there's, it doesn't look too complicated, but there definitely are things going on here that uh, we need to resolve. Uh, but I would guess that it has at least th these three kinds of syllable types. Now, what about stress? Um, I wrote it 
asystematically, I'm afraid. But uh, when I noticed that it, it did seem to vary sometimes. Let's think about the grammar for a bit. Um, there are lots of things going on there. What, if, if we were just to look at the basic constituent order, this basic constituent order, what did it seem to be? This is somewhat artificial, right? Uh, S, yeah. S, O, indirect object, D. And that is the most common order in the world. Uh, but I would caution you against taking that too seriously to begin with. There's a reason why people would give any particular order as the most common order in a elicitation like this. But before we came to any uh, rush judgments about the word order, we, the constituent order, we'd also want to look at how these things appear in texts and discourses. But it certainly seems to be um, a familiar pattern to us, not the OS or BSO uh, or OSD, but uh, SOV. Now what about, uh, let's think our way through some of these, let's, th let's take noun phrases first. What's the first thing that appears in a noun phrase? What? Uh, in, our, in our data, I won't be writing an article on this, but, uh, uh, and the numeral, and then we got an adjective, and, and eventually we want to get different kinds of adjectives, and then the, the noun. That seemed to be the basic order of, well, of things we got in the noun phrase. Um, and if you want to think that the language has a verb phrase, it's sort of like that. Um, what, about, what about agreement? We've got some of that on the other side here. Um, agreement between the verb and the subject. Did you see any of that? Um, okay, so uh, sit up. Ma a or ma? Would, how would it sound to say ma a? Ma, ma. So first, first person sit up, and then the a seems to be agreement with uh, first person, unless somebody has another idea about that. Whereas with uh, third person, so you had ma stand up, ma ute, uh, ma base. But uh, third person uh, is either nothing there or good news, the news, and then we also had nuhus, showing this H dropping out and vowel shortening across. So, so if I say my hand, I mean, most likely what you'll get the first time is your hand, uh, rather than my hand, and then you ask them, point to their hand, and then they might say my hand, but if you repeat after them, my hand, you will usually get it corrected to my hand if you're saying your hand, and pointing to it like this. And as far as an imperative, um, if you, if you just repeat it and go through it, that's why it's absolutely vital as you get the answers to repeat them, to go through them, to act them out so that the speaker has it. I mean, they're coming at this, they have no clue what you want, right? And there's absolutely no idea. Most people don't know what you're doing, especially if you're working in some of the societies of the Amazon where people believe that you're born. I mean, they, they have um, the opposite of universal grammar. They have individual grammars that are innately specified. Um, and... Um, you're either born speaking the language or not. And so the concept that you would learn their language is a foreign concept. With milk, a very natural kind of thing that happens, uh, I let them see what it was and smell it to figure out what it was. And so the answer was, it smells good, which is a perfectly fine answer. It wasn't the one that I was thinking of. Uh, and, and so I wrote it down. And then when I got other things, it was clear that I didn't know what that meant. Uh, so we go back to that. Okay? We go back to that. And um, these things will appear as you use it, but we got, uh, we got milk, and then cup, and then um, uh, we got a CD for a jar, or a bottle, or whatever. Um, now, in, in just a short amount of time, we've seen that without any language in common, we can come up with all kinds of information about it. But, as we internalize this, and that's really the vital thing, what you find, and those of you who have done field work know this, as you continue to work with people, their interest in working with you declines rapidly to the degree that you're not learning the language. If you're simply asking them things over and over and you're not making an attempt to communicate with them in their language, my experience is that people's patience runs fairly thin. And so you have to be making progress in this. 
I would say um, that I, I can usually not work with, with uh, language associates, language teachers, consultants, whatever we call the people who, who turn us on to all the grooving data. Um, I can't work with people for more than two to three hours maximum in a day because it takes me five to six hours to process all the information that I got in that period of time and to do my very best to memorize it and use it in context. After I've done that, I have a time that I call perambulatory uh, elicitation or language use. I just walk village with the local context and try to use what I got to see if I got it right. So if I thought this meant uh, this is milk and walked around, you know, I mean, not that I would walk around with milk and show it to people, uh, uh, I, would, I would quickly be disabused of that notion. Uh, so using this and processing the information, making progress, remember, that the people who are teaching you their language are, in a sense, your supervisors, your superiors, and you really need to report to them and show them that this information is useful to you by learning it, uh, learning the language. And one of the advantages to the monolingual method is that you don't come in as a teacher, you come in as a student. Um, you don't have uh, just a working relationship with the people, but you are, in fact, clearly the inferior when it comes to knowledge and the, and the butt of the jokes and everything because you say things so silly and... Um, and yet, that's part of the advantage in it, because it's through that kind of relationship that you begin to learn things that you couldn't learn otherwise. The capital L, uh, doing monolingual fieldwork, it really involves the whole person. And for Ken, this is what linguistics was all about. It's a holistic approach to figuring out language and culture. Um, it is um, practical. The monolingual shows the practicality of linguistic field methodology. Um, and, and again, that gets back to my idea of Ken as a pragmatist, that, that mm -hmm. the way to evaluate a theory was the usefulness of that theory f as a tool for what you wanted to do. And monolingual fieldwork shows to people, I mean, it's not really a magic show. I mean, if it's a magic show, I'd have gotten everything right, or you wouldn't have known. But as, as a group of linguists, you, it's all too clear what's going on and what should be going on that's not going on. So it's not magic, but it, it does show uh, the usefulness of, of, of doing this and the fact that you can get into a language within the first few minutes. Ken said his first linguistic presentation was at an LSA meeting, one of the first LSA meetings, and there were only, I guess, only about 10 people in the room. And on the front row was uh, Leonard Bloomfield and Edward Sapir and Bernard Block and uh, uh, Charles Fries and, and uh, Charles Hockett. And it was a pretty good audience, even though it was small. Um, <laughs> and... <clears throat> Afterwards, Ken hadn't done a PhD, and afterwards, Bloomfield and Sapir tried very hard to persuade him to go to their respective institutions to do his PhD with each of them. He was much more drawn to Sapir, although he tremendously respected both of them, but he wanted to do applied work. That's why he, came, he wanted to work with Charles Free. The, the practical aspects um, of uh, Ken's work are, are some of the greatest uh, lessons for us to take today, it seems to me. And uh, being concerned with why rabbits uh, go hippity hop and not just hoppity hip is, is an, actually an important question. Why we say red, white, and blue instead of white, blue, and red. And, and these, these sorts of trivial things until we start thinking about them and realize they're not so trivial. And that it, it actually may be true that what's most interesting about language is language, our language is not language with a capital L, but language with a big S at the end. And, um, <coughs> And, and, uh, and the differences between languages may turn out to be more important to us than the similarities. For many decades now, we've been told to look at the similarities and try to understand the similarities. But it may be that uh, the differences are just as important as the similarities, perhaps even more so. And that the American structuralists and descriptivists for emphasizing that might have been right in some very important way that we've lost sight of over the years. And I think that's one of the lessons I learned from Ken, names like, uh, like uh, Ken Pike and, and the tradition that that comes from won't be lost to us over the years. Thanks. <laughs>